Hello, Spanish 10. Um, today we're going to be talking about post-colonial blues, which, which is chapter 10. So liberty, equality, and America for an Americans, these ideas uh, that loosely group the, you know, everybody under the banner of liberalism made Latin America's independence possible. Um, but you will see that all these ideals will disappear little by little in practice. They became the backdrop of the constitutions of, and they form about a dozen new republics. And in 1825, only Brazil remained a monarchy with the Brazilian Emperor Pedro I. So liberals in Latin America tried to put these ideas into practice, but they had horrible results. Uh, it was very much in theory, but not in practice. There was a political instability and economic failure. All the old habits of, you know, hierarchy remained. And liberal, liberalism grew out of social and economic transformations uh, like capitalist trade, manufacturing, and a middle class that occurred in France and England. So the caste system was banished from the census and all forms of the church records, but um, in practice, it was still in the society. In practice, the elite, you know, leaders, Latin American leaders, um, had all the power and they could not accept the social equality for everybody. They had this admiration towards Europe. You will see they will follow the models of England and France and the US. And uh, this made the liberals Eurocentric, kind of like focusing on Europe and their ideas and, and uh, models. Uh, the conservatives and liberals had contrasting agendas. As you will see here, the liberals, they wanted to separate the church from the state. Uh, they were progressive. They liked the U.S., England, and Fran France. And the conservatives, they will remain Catholic, okay, as, and make it an official religion, and the church to be dominant in the education system. Uh, colonial or Spanish models were still followed. So you have two ideals, the liberals and the conservatives, and these two ideals will divide the people of Latin America. The situation after the independence. Things were not very smooth after independence. Uh, during the wars of independence, the Mexican and Peruvian silver mines were hit very hard with destruction, and not many banks um, existed and they did not have the capitals to rebuild. The control of trade went into the hands of uh, foreigners like the British, the French, and the US traders. And Creoles had little experiences with business businesses, so they only invested on land. And there was no good transporta transportation to transport the goods, no bridges or roads. So the infrastructure was not made to make progress. The governing institutions had to be built from scratch and that was very difficult. Uh, the only overdeveloped side was the army and they were paying high salaries to the officers of the army. So the government is really weak, they're understaffed, and they found it very hard to ad, uh, admi administer the taxes. Latin America relied mainly on import and export of tariffs, and they did not have the resources nor the allies to achieve success. So it's like starting everything from scratch, bad infrastructure, bad uh, understaffed governments, and you know, they did not have all the tools to be successful after independence, as you can see. 
constitutional presidents were overthrown with the military, a lot of coups during this time. And between the independence and the 1850s, few governments were able to implement their programs and make it work successfully. Most liberals and conservatives saw politics as a way to make themselves rich. So there's a lot of corruption going on. And there's something called patronage. Uh, people in power could distribute their benefits to their friends and followers to reward their royalty. And we'll see that into practice in many places like um, Argentina, you know, uh, and Paraguay and other places. The patronage politics uh, had a caudillo leadership and it was very much like the post-colonial way of doing things in Latin America. Also, uh, what is patronage politics and caudillo leadership? Patronage politics made corruption, you know, um, okay. They will get give all the benefits to the family and friends of the person who was in power. Uh, there were levels of patronage. At election time, for example, the clients voted for their patron, like say Don Miguel, and they received favors and honors from the pat patron. Uh, wealthier and more powerful than himself, and you know, a cabinet minister, the state governor, and so on, until the highest patron of all was the party's national leader, El Caudillo. So everybody who followed, for example, Don Miguel, were called Miguelistas. A caudillo is a strong political leader who commands the personal royalty of many followers. And caudillos were typically very rich. They were landowners or they had some kind of military background. They were war heroes. So they had the power of a private army and they will use their power uh, by giving favors to the people who supported uh, him. So we're going to see an example of this caudillo or patronage, um, you know, politics. We have Juan Manuel de Rosas in Argentina, who was uh, president, you know, Argentina between uh, 1829 and 1852. Juan Manuel de Rosas is an example of caudillo. And he was a rancher in the Pampas, in the plains of Argentina and he will use violence against his opponent to in, instill fear. And also he had a very good propaganda and political imagery. Uh, he represented himself as a man of the people and he identified with the gauchos of the Pampas who are the cowboys and the poor black workers in the city. And he portrayed the city people, so he was a countryman. And he portrayed the city people as being unmanly, not being like a man and being more like a woman when they were Eurocentric, you know, following the European ways. He protected the landowners and he even won, um, you know, patriotic glory by defeating the British and the French interventions in the 1830s and 1840s. And there's even a book about him and also short stories that were written about him because he was a brutal caudillo who would slaughter people to make sure that um, his ways are being followed. So here we have Jose Antonio Paez from Venezuela and he was of mixed race and he rose to leadership because uh, he worked with Bolivar uh, in the Orinoco Plains. He was an ally of Bolivar during the wars of independence. Uh, his physical courage made him the first president of Venezuela, but it wasn't because of his social prestige. He ruled over an alliance of regional caudillos who also had risen in the fighting of independence. And politics was by force and arms. So many of these caudillos will use um, violence and fear to have followers as well as the patronage system. Uh, Francisco Mozaran was the one who um, was in the leadership position in Central America. 
he was born in Honduras with French connections and Federalist, you know, uh, ideas. Federalist means fought for, you know, complete self-government and full provincial autonomy. So instead of it being centralized in the main government, they would have uh, the, provi the provinces have autonomy. Uh, liberal reforms, anti-church measures, and legal code imported from the U.S. were unpopular with him. And in the late 1830s, Rafael Carrera, a conservative caudillo, overthrew him. Rafael Carre Carrera will be the leader of Central America after him. And he was a rural mestizo with ties to Guatemala's indigenous people. He protected their welfare, the village lands, um, and shielded the Catholic Church and they honor the folk, uh, he honored the folk culture. Uh, he was absorbed in governing Guatemala and he allowed the United Provinces of Central America to fall apart. And because he was so focused in Guatemala, Central America uh, ends up dividing into many republics that you will see five different countries later on. Dr. Jose Gaspar Rodriguez in Fran de Francia was the leader in Paraguay. He was a doctor of theology and a scholar, and he was a strict conservative dictator, calling himself El Supremo. He sealed off Paraguay from the world, from all the European cultural influences, and few European merchants were allowed to visit but many of them didn't even return to Europe because they were under house arrest. And Paraguay became independent, self-sufficient, and relatively, they say, prosperous under um, Gaspar Rodriguez de Francia. The first generation of independence, um, politics really uh, was a double game because in theory and practice, they were very different. Uh, constitutions were written many times, one every 10 years in Colombia, for example, and the new presidents were replaced by revolution. Corruption, there was a lot of corruption. Governments frequently manipulated the vote count and used the police to determine the outcomes of elections. So you can kind of see how they instill fear to make people vote a certain way. Colombia, uh, the former vice royalty of New Granada, split into the present uh, three countries of Colombia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. And Central America split into five countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. And this divided Latin America into 16 sovereign political fragments. This is not counting Cuba and Puerto Rico. And also Panama is not a country yet, as you will see in the map later on. Uh, Peru, Argentina, and Mexico headed for, you know, further splits between centralist and federalist. And here's the map you can see here. Uh, you will see Imperio de Brasil. You have the Brazilian colony still. It's an empire that is led by Pedro I. And then remember Rio de la Plata? The Viceroyalty of Rio de la Plata split into all these countries, Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay, Argentina, Uruguay, and Chile. And uh, you can see here uh, New Granada is split into Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador, and it still includes Panama over here. And Central America split into Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. And then they carry and still, you know, Cuba and Puerto Rico are um, part of the Spanish colony. Okay, that's it for now. And we'll see you on the next video. Okay, bye.